It's September 1st, 2021, and you are back with us at Crime After Crime. I'm John Lorden. And I am Danielle Hallen. Welcome, you guys. So good to have all of you here again. We're, we're going to have a good time looking into two true crime cases, um, and I'm super excited about it. Danielle's got one that's a little current. I've got one that's a little historical. Yep. We're gonna Mine's take definitely care. a little crazy. <laughs> hey, no, 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 no. Mine's crazy too. <laughs> seems seems to be a running theme on this show. Um, before we get started, I just want to give a huge thank you to the many people that bought CrimeCon tickets and want to join our special meetup. About half of those spaces are taken, but there is still room for you. Do you want to come to Las Vegas April 29th through May 1st, 2022? Weird saying that, just by the way. For CrimeCon, plus hang out with us at a special meetup and have John buy your first round. You'll also save 10% off your general CrimeCon admission. Just go to CrimeCon.com and buy your ticket right now using code CRIMEAFTERCRIME. And after you get your converse, conversation, no, after you get your confirmation, forward it to us at Vegas at CrimeAfterCrimePodcast.com. And if you do that in time, you're in for the meetup. Plus, you're getting a custom limited run t-shirt, all our best swag, and an amazing time at CrimeCon Las Vegas. You know what I was thinking, Danielle? I'm wondering if that custom t-shirt might have Simpsonized superhero art on it. I really hope so. Mm, it's only mm, fitting. Mm. I got my mug, by the way, finally. And, <laughs> you uh, did? Yeah. Isn't yeah. it great? <laughs> I love it. It's awesome. We hope to see you there. Um, before we get to the voting results for last month's episode, we do want to say thank you to our audience for letting us know about a learning moment for us all. So during our discussion about the traveling community wedding, we used a term that we are learning is inappropriate. While we weren't discussing the Romani people in particular, we still really want to avoid anything hurtful. So a huge thank you to you guys for letting us know about that. Yeah, and we really appreciate all the information, yeah. but also the tone that you guys had about it. Um, it's It was really cool, very helpful to understand that. And we just, we appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for that. It is now time for the results, Danielle. Last episode, we looked into wedding crimes. Danielle told the story of an entire wedding that was staged to arrest multiple criminals. And mm -hmm. I told the story of what seemed like a terrible abduction that actually turned out to be a runaway bride. And let me just put in the sound effect now. Wah, wah. Because <laughs> wait till you see what happened with these results. How did it play out, Danielle? All right. So on the website poll, I received 85% of the votes. Woo! Ouch. Holy crap. <laughs> well, I'm telling you, it wasn't even about me and my, like that. I'm the so story. mesmerized by the people in that story still to this yeah. day. You had knowing good people. That, exactly. And Great knowing story. that no one lives in North Carolina or lived before he passed away in North Carolina, I'm proud. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. John received 15% of the votes. And then on Twitter, I received 84% and John received 16%. Well, means I have to hand this over. It was good having you for the last month, but you are now going back over to Danielle. There we go. Bye-bye, Mug. Thank you. That was a pretty flawless transition. I must it was say, a good for one. anyone watching the video, that was fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> and now I have turned my mug into Gatorade. There we go. That's how I'm going to get through today's episode. Today, we are looking at showbiz crimes, stories where lights and cameras cross over with handcuffs and mug shots. As always, we're going to start with a story from the amazing and talented Danielle Hallen, and I'm excited. Now, this is actually a very interesting topic because I feel like I kind of went in at a disadvantage because I feel like you know a lot about showbiz and behind the scenes things. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're like, Maybe. I don't want to intimidate you, but yes, you're absolutely right. Yeah. But I feel like I kind of learned a lot looking into this. <laughs> He's I like, a, I may or may not. I have a clacker board right here. Hold on. Exactly. There we go. And we're ready he to was, roll. He was prepared. <laughs> but I feel like I kind of knew about scary things that happened in Hollywood. But man, this opened my eyes. Now, Hollywood is known as being one of the hardest industries to get into. Statistics show, and this is just according to a random study, that you have to be 29 or younger. Ooh, 
Wow. If you're not, if you're over the age of 29 and you're not famous yet, they say to give it up. You have to come from a wealthy background, know people who know people, or be one of the less than 0.04% that just get lucky. Mm, wealthy so background or people that know people. I'll keep those in mind for my story. <laughs> Sounds like perfect. <laughs> Struggling artists, actors, models, and more cling to hope and social media trying to get their big break. But unfortunately, this combination of things typically leads to desperation, trusting without question. John's like, yep, I've seen this happen. And unfortunately, it makes these individuals perfect for a good scam. Mm. So between 2015 and 2020, Aspiring stars were making their typical rounds, sending portfolios filled with photos, headshots, screenplays, and more to local bigwigs. It's kind of like sending a mass email, you know, to a random group off the internet and then hoping someone takes a bite. Now, a bunch of these individuals that felt their chances were pretty much non-existent got a response, along with a few others that had just managed to get lucky on other public projects, including a 27-year-old unnamed documentary photographer. This person will still not reveal their name after what happened to them. That should give you wow. a little wow. foreshadowing. Yeah. So this photographer had already worked with a handful of well-known newspapers and magazines, but he had not directly been reached out to by anyone or to anyone. Instead, he was unexpectedly reached out to by Amy Pascal, who at the time was the former co-chair of Sony. Now, this is massive. Everyone's waiting for their big break. It's not every day that you're reached out to by an exec from a massive company like Sony asking you to be a big part of a project that could be your foot in the door of Hollywood. Amy, Amy Pascal like decides who Spider-Man is going to be. Exactly. Like, 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 yeah, this is she's, a big deal. She's about as high, almost as high as you can go in mm -hmm. that organization. Yeah. I told you, John knows everything. <laughs> <laughs> He's got this. <laughs> well, she was. I know that there was a yeah. little, but yeah. Hiccup, yeah. but. Mm -hmm. But a few things about this email seemed a little strange. The URL in the email was pascalfilms.com, but that domain didn't exist. After some digger deep, digger deeping, <laughs> deeper digging, he found that Pascal actually had an embarrassing security breach in 2015, which may be what John was just talking about. Mm -hmm. And so he believed, you know, maybe she's just protecting her online presence. So in a leap of faith, this email turned into a phone call where the project was outlined. Pascal brought up the hack saying that it had in fact forced her underground. Uh, you know, she was having to create this whole new company, staff and more, but she was still working behind the scenes and wanted him to be a part of it. Pascal knew all about this man's photography, everything, knew intimate details of the corporate clients that he previously worked with. And this was really enough to confirm her identity in his eyes and seal the deal. Now, the photographer was asked to head to Indonesia, a place that he was familiar with through prior work. So it's not really strange to be called out to this random location. He was told the project would be a one week event where he would shoot at certain pre-picked locations. And he was essentially creating a storyboard to pitch to buyers in LA with Pascal. Now, the photographer was also told he was going to have to pay his way and travel to Indonesia. So plane tickets for private drivers that have been chosen for security purposes, food permits, you name it. He would have to cover it, but he would be reimbursed afterwards. Now, now I can just tell you after doing a Netflix project, mm -hmm. that's not that's, out that's, of, yeah. yeah, that's not out of the realm of possibility at all. Um, there, you know, there is, uh, you cover this, we'll reimburse you that, that totally normal for a situation like this. So yeah, I know some of you out there are probably going like, uh, -oh, immediately like uh, red flag. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Yeah. A lot of the times it's kind of like a, especially in these scenarios that you pay your way, improve yourself. And then after that, things will usually be handled for you. So the photographer agreed, signed a beautifully written contract and headed to Jakarta but the second he touched down in Indonesia, everything started to go wrong. This photographer handed over money to the driver, paid every single morning for permits in order to work in the country because he was there on a travel visa, not like a work visa. Right. He spoke multiple times a day to Pascal and this male under her working on the project, but every single day there was some new excuse. The locations for shoots changed, board members totally scrapped ideas, new locations were added to this long list, and this photographer worked himself into the ground, 
reimbursement money never showed up into his account. It was again, always an excuse. One week of work turned into six months of gaslighting threats and $65,000 out of his pocket. Whoa. Jeez. And then out of nowhere, with no warning, the project was canceled. He realized at this point he had been scammed, but what mm. he didn't know was that he was actually one of hundreds. An investigative firm at the time called K2 Intelligence was also working on this case unknowingly. They'd been reached out to by numerous clients, all of these high up Hollywood females claiming that they had been impersonated. Complaints were popping up all over that these large names were doing hundreds of struggling artists dirty. I'm talking names like Kathleen Kennedy, uh, Universal's chair Donna Langley, Paramount head Sherry Lansing, Wendy Murdoch, whose husband was a big exec at Fox. The mm -hmm. list went on and on. And some of these people even had angry victims showing up at their homes, like screaming up to their high rises, demanding to be paid. And between police and assistance, it was found that these demands were, you know, for money from projects that were not at all connected to these women. So investigator Nicolette Kotsianas, I love that last name, mm -hmm. from K2 began to reach out to victims to hear more about their complaints. And she noticed that despite the complaints being about all these separate clients of her, hers, they all seem to play out the same. So she went to authorities with a handful of stories, hoping that they would, you know, stop this scam. But they said, that it was going to take a lot more than that to stop it. They said at this point, all the victims had signed contracts. So it was just a business deal gone wrong and nothing more. Basically, like they're stupid, they fell for it. <laughs> you know, yeah. they signed a business deal and it didn't go through and now they're mad. So she set out to find as many stories as possible. And that's kind of the thing about scamming people in this industry. People with followings on social media and blogs, people that love to entertain and talk, they're going to talk about it. So there were blogs and posts everywhere. Victims began coming forward one by one. Everyone from makeup artists to stuntmen, cameramen, models, actors, singers, you guys, <laughs> people from all over the world with the same experience. They all have been reached out to by a man claiming to work under one of these well-known women. Each victim was promised work on a movie in some capacity in Indonesia. They were promised $15,000 a day and if you're someone who, you know, has been a struggling on the rise actor who, you know, isn't making a lot of money, that's so much. You can make a year's worth of income in a week. Yeah. I mean, it was a number and an opportunity that they couldn't pass up. But just like the photographer, once they reached Indonesia, they were picked up by a driver, towed it around the area for hours on end. They were paying upwards of $3,000 a day for their permits translators, booking fees, and we're all just sitting on this wild goose chase for their work. And then if these artists didn't pay up, the dynamic duo behind the scenes would reach out to their families to set up wire transfers, pretty much banking on the idea that their families didn't want to see their dreams ruined. Nobody questioned a thing at first because of the knowledge these people seemed to have and the amount of time they seemed to invest. They thought there was no way this wasn't the real deal. Now, one screenwriter in particular named Greg was a part of this scam in 2015. The male involved went by the name of Anad Sippy. And this is, I think, the only time these scammers actually met anyone face to face. Now, this man saying his name was Anand Sippy met Greg and his partner six times in Indonesia. And the female running the show, they never saw but she actually helped for hours and hours on end, days, months, basically helping them write the screenplay over the phone. You know, so they're like, there's no way this is fake. All this time's invested. We've met this guy in a business room. He had a media room, all these different things. They had phone meetings with China. You know, they had their family involved as managers. But at the end of it all, they were scammed out of $100,000 and the project was ripped from underneath of them. Artists had their lives and careers threatened if they didn't stay to finish the job. Anyone that questioned where their reimbursement was ended up just being redirected and fed lies. After all, these people were preyed on because they would do anything to make a name for themselves. Hollywood is known as a place of being brutal. Like you, you know, you buck up or you get trampled. So this just gave the scammer leeway and what they could get away with. Sexual advances were even made in order to get material to blackmail these people, if needed, people were losing their life savings, their family's trust, and their hope for a secure future. 
So K2 Intelligence really stepped it up and compiled hours and hours of recordings and evidence that had been kept by the victims. At this point, they knew there was at least one man and one woman involved in the scam. There was a driver that was toting all these people around, and then this strange man in a moped that would only show up to pick up money. But once they really, I know, but once they started going through phone recordings, Nicolette realized that the males and females in all these calls claiming to be different people from different countries with different accents, they all used the same phrases and repeated language. It wasn't a few people involved in this scam. It was one man, one mastermind behind it all, pretending to be everyone, particularly these well-known women of Hollywood. This single person was using burner phone after burner phone, speaking to hundreds of victims. He alone had created hundreds of GoDaddy accounts in order to send fake emails from seemingly legitimate companies. He made fake websites that could fool anyone, mastered accents, mastered dozens of crafts to relate to his victims. He had written thousands of pages of legal documents tweaked to each victim's project. And when victims were told that it was just one man, they were shocked. People who spent their life acting said this was acting like they had never seen before. All of the characters this person was pretending to be had these well-built backgrounds. They had fully researched their victims. The male typically played the bad cop, and then the woman would come in, you know, to save the day, be a voice of reason, get these people to continue working. And these phone calls were back to back. Knowing that one person wore all these hats gave this case a terrifying turn. After searching around, they found that this man had not just targeted aspiring artists. And this one really got to me. Uh Uh-oh. He even targeted military personnel. What? Claiming to need to cast ex-Marines for action movies. Or he needed them as bodyguards, security purposes. I mean, he he sent dozens of Marines to Indonesia to be security guards. Wow. Wow. This con man was the best of the best. He took the time to analyze each victim and learn their past to know exactly how to control them. This was a social engineering scam. But even with recordings and receipts, no one could figure out who was behind this because everything that had been presented was fake. They were able to trace it. The calls were coming from somewhere in the UK. We know the money was being handed over in Indonesia. Most of the victims were coming from the US. (laughs) Yeah. So it's kind of going from everywhere. And some producers even decided to file lawsuits against this mystery person in hopes that subpoena power would somehow help investigators find out who was behind it all. Well, and think how tricky that is when you're exactly. talking. It's an international case, effectively. So you've mm-hmm. got different jurisdictions and different laws that apply in those areas. And if this person is doing all that footwork and and being that intelligent about it, yep. I think they're probably looking into the legal aspects as well and using different countries as methods of protection to help protect them. Especially, you know, when they're going to the FBI and local police and they're saying, yeah, but there was, this was a business deal. It just went bad. Right. You know, they didn't with, you know, uphold their end of the deal. You know, eventually Vanity Fair created a podcast to allow voices of the victims to be heard so that hopefully, you know, more could be spared and this mastermind could be captured and, This man was then dubbed the Hollywood con queen. But despite Vanity Fair and K2 Intelligence closing in on the scammer, it actually just kind of made him push his limits further. He started going after some of the richest individuals in the world, particularly one of the richest women in the world whose name has been withheld, thinking that even she could be scammed since these smaller victims were only offering up so much money. Yeah. But at this point, they had hundreds of victims. So K2 Intelligence Intelligence approached the FBI again, and they decided to start working together, and they worked for two and a half years. During that time span, they were fielding at least two calls a month from new victims. Mm. And I think about like the amount of work this guy was putting in behind the scenes, legal documents, fake websites, emails, multiple phone calls a day, hours and hours on end. He's working hard, but look at those amounts that you're talking about as well. Exactly. Like, you know, with the writer... You know, Mm -hmm. he's having him rewrite stuff and he's acting as different people helping in the writing process. Like he's probably spending all day working that guy. But then at the end of that, you're coming out with $100,000 at the end of that scam, which I think for that one went on for a prolonged period of time. But still, that's I mean, you know, that's even if you focus on that one guy, that's a nice little income you're making for yourself for just for the whole year even. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm. Nicolette even began receiving calls from the scammer, claiming he was a victim 
and that there really was this evil woman behind all of this. So he, he I think he kind of started feeling the heat yeah. and ultimately his identity was found. So the screenwriter named Greg that met Anon Sippy also had a copy of a passport they saw Anon with, with the name Gobind Lal Tahil on it. So this information was passed to a man named Ben Decker, who's a digital investigator, and he was able to find this old story deep in internet archives about a man named Rudy Satapo from Indonesia. Okay. And it mentioned this Gobind Lal character. It spoke about owning the rights to a mini series called The Black Widow. <laughs> <laughs> and how it basically was a big scam. So things were starting to fall into place. Rudy was known as a con man. Um, you know, he he did exactly what was going on at this point. So they thought they had their guy, but then they found that he actually had been in imprisoned for his crimes for years at this point. So he couldn't have been involved. But they managed to find a woman that he had been married to for a period of time. And she said that Rudy had a protege, a mm. man that she knew as Gobind that he met while in prison. This woman said that she spoke to Gobind all the time. He was a well-known food blogger in the UK where the calls were coming from. So the pieces started to fall into place even more. In 2020, after scamming hundreds of victims out of at least $2 million in that five years, 41-year-old Hargobin Tahil Romani was arrested in Manchester, England. He had, in fact, been going by the name Gobin Tahil on Instagram. He was pretending to be a food and fitness influencer. He had collaborated with tons of well-known influencers in the genre, had two massive social media accounts under the name of Pure Bites and I Spin the Tales, which have since been deleted. And because Greg had actually been the only person to meet this Anon Sippy person, Face to face, he was able to confirm that Anon was the same person as Gobind Tahil from the passport, who was the same person as Hargobind Tahil Romani. Wow. Hargobind was actually born in Indonesia to a father in production, which is what introduced him to this sort of lifestyle. Now, when both of his parents passed away, he actually ended up fighting with his siblings over property and um, inheritance. And I don't know the whole story, but and ended up casting him out of the family. He eventually moved to the US for college where he decided to start his crime spree. He was charged with misappropriation of school funds and falsifying checks in Las Vegas. Um, he was caught numerous times trying to get out of these situations by calling in to make complaints, impersonating people. He called in as Kate Blanchett. <laughs> he did, he called in as Kate Blanchett. It was like the way you're treating Hargobind Teo Romani is not right. I mean, it was an absolute disaster. So he'd been doing this for years and he ended up back in Indonesia where he was then charged with embezzlement. I couldn't get more details on that. Um, but even then when he was arrested in Indonesia, he wouldn't stop. While he was in prison, he managed to get his hands on a cell phone and he proceeded to call in a bomb threat to the US embassy, pretending to be someone from the US, someone from Russia and someone from Afghanistan. Why doesn't this guy do a radio show? Like, I know. He, he could have all, he could be all of his own callers. Exactly. He, <laughs> and oh, they'd be celebrities. Exactly. People would be so fascinated. And <laughs> apparently when he was in the U.S., he also called in a threat to the Pentagon. Wow. wow. And he thought it was funny all the times he was interviewed about it. Now, ultimately, he was caught for calling, you know, the bomb threat to the U.S. Embassy. Um, they did extend his time. And unfortunately, during this time is when he met Rudy, who introduced him to this next scam. So despite the money and pain this man caused so many, pretty much all of them have said that this man's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> yeah. You know, he should have used his intelligence for good. These people said they had no idea how he managed to get all these things done. I mean, and he his work ethic. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just endless work. He was calling people numerous times a day, spending hours with them on the phone with Greg in particular. I mean, he totally changed the entire screenplay, like totally changed the direction of the movie and how they wanted to do it. Came up with all these great ideas for this movie. Interestingly enough, he created a character based after himself, which they realized obviously after the fact they called, which he said, you know, it's this woman and she's controlling people and she is pretending to be a man and coming to this girl in her dreams and getting her to do things by pretending to be her father. And he was like, you know, a chameleon of the mind. Mm-hmm. So he was creating these things after himself. 
you know, but they were like, he could have used that. He could have used this for something good. Hours spent. And, you know, while he's doing this as well, keep in mind, he also was pretending to be a fitness blogger. Right, right. All these things are going on all at one time. I can barely handle being a YouTuber half the time. But he's over <laughs> here, like, impersonating dozens of people, writing legal documents, all these things. Well, and with all the money that he scammed out of people, like, you know, produce something. Like, go ahead and... You know, and and then have those people that you're scamming, you'll have a real project for them. Exactly. And maybe you'll put out something cool. Like he's doing all of the work. Why aren't you just crossing the finish line and like, okay, we're gonna do a independent production of this sci-fi script that these guys are working on, and we need actors because mm -hmm. apparently there's a lesson here, and and I know this from my experience back in the entertainment area. There's people that are willing to work for free. Mm -hmm. There's people that are willing to pay to play. They're willing to put up the money to make the project happen, especially yeah. if they believe in it because it's going to launch their next thing or just get them on a screen. Yep. So with him realizing that, it's so strange to me that he didn't just kind of, for all the work, all the effort, focus it to a real effort of, hey, look, I can produce something here because I've got all these people that are mm -hmm. coming. They're throwing money at me every which way. Makes well, being who I am and my interest in psychology, I actually dove deeper into this. Nice. And he, it wasn't about the money. The money was there and made it fun and interesting. It's how it kept them there, tied them to it, tied them together. But from the psychologists and profilers and people that have looked into us, they believe it was, he's a sociopath, that it was always about that form of control. Yeah. That yeah. it was always about seeing how far he could push people and get people to believe him. He realized he was good at accents and good at pretending to be certain people, even at a young age. And so that is what he was enjoying. He was enjoying mm -hmm. pushing people to their limits. And it was never about the money. But, you know, a good director does that, too. Like mm -hmm. there's there's still this aspect of he was putting on a performance. Yep for a very small audience. And if he would have just he needed to know where to draw the line and then make it into something better. Right. Right. Or, or opened up his scope mm -hmm. to, you know what, I want a bigger crowd of people to watch what's going down with this. Um, yeah. I mean, wow. he, he had people hired out. There's a whole, you can find all these pictures online from where he was a food blogger and he's got all these like magazine quality photos of himself you know, around this dining room table. I mean, it's just, it's so interesting. I think he just liked feeling like he could live so many different experiences, like life yeah. experiences. Yep. I mean, but he was a master at it. You guys, while he was in Indonesia, while all this was going on, he was putting on whole events, whole fake events. Like he offered to take on, I think it was like teen, Miss Teen Indonesia. You guys, he convinced Enrique Iglesias to fly to Indonesia. <laughs> Enrique Iglesias came to Indonesia. I kid you not. And then got there and was like, oh, wow, never mind. I've been scammed. Like he just, he, I mean, tried to con Beyonce, Katy Perry, successfully conned Enrique Iglesias. I mean, it's the, I don't even understand how he did it. But as far as I know, he's still waiting to be extradited to the U.S. Mm. Um, they expect him to be sentenced to at least a few decades in prison for what he's done. He's facing eight total felony charges, most of them related to obviously wire fraud um, and identity theft. I mean, he's destroyed people's lives. These people spent their life savings and everything they could in hopes of you know, creating something. And he just totally took that away from them. Is he dealing with charges in the UK before he gets extradited or? I'm not sure. I'm not okay. sure how it's gonna go. I. That's the thing is I know that the U.S. came over. He was arrested in Manchester. They're charging him all these things in the United States because I think the victims were mainly in the United States. Yeah. I don't, I mean, there's so, you guys, he can be charged from so many different angles. They can charge him probably in Indonesia. They can charge him, um, you know, so many different levels. These people can bring, you know, civil claims up against him. You yeah. Know? And he could be sued so many times. I don't, I don't know. I feel like this is just kind of like the beginning steps, but I feel like if he's ever successfully charged, which he should be, um, it's just going to open a whole other thing for him, but he'll just yeah. continue in prison. He'll find ways to entertain himself in prison. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe he'll write a book. 
No, yeah, probably. I'll write a book <laughs> using one of his fake names. But a huge thank you to VanityFair.com, The Hollywood Reporter, the series Generation Hustle, which I was introduced to through this about all sorts of scams, and it's fascinating. Um, and also Bustle.com. Nice, nice. Um, th- it's interesting because it's like you took the term showbiz crime <laughs> and just found something that is like a perfect fit for it. It's like it's almost like the showbiz of crime exactly. in that story because this so dude crazy. Yeah, he's an actor. He's a writer. He's his own lawyer. I mean, <laughs> he's I mean, got all the main things. He's his own agent. Oh, he's just getting it. And he does them all perfectly. Like yeah. people go to school and spend years to perfect that kind of craft. And right. he's doing them all seamlessly. Yeah. I mean, wow. he could be a total mastermind for the perfect, great reasons instead of bad ones. Right. Right. Well, that's a great one, Danielle. That's a great one. Uh, is my story from the past going to be enough to take it? I don't know. We're going to have to find out when we get to the other side of this commercial break. In a world where life is too complicated, there's one company that can help you be a superstar in the kitchen. That company is HelloFresh. They get rid of the stressful meal planning and their no contact delivery brings a box right to my door with everything I need to pull together a delicious meal in about 30 minutes. With more than 50 menu and market items, there's something for everyone to enjoy. You can also stay camera ready with their calorie smart, carb smart, vegetarian and pescatarian meal options. Four out of five customers say HelloFresh helps them lead a healthier lifestyle. Last week, I had their barbecue pineapple flatbread and I'm telling you, this thing deserves an Oscar. It's actually in their hall of fame. It's in their official hall of fame. Sweet savory and meat free it was a perfect choice for a vegetarian with a cheese fetish like me the fall harvest is officially on with HelloFresh. count on seasonal recipes like pumpkin cinnamon rolls oh my mouth is watering just like what'd saying you that say? out loud what'd you say <laughs> pumpkin cinnamon rolls Ooh. And, and high quality ingredients that travel from the farm to your front door in less than a week and you don't need an agent or a manager, just use the quick and easy HelloFresh app to skip a week, pick alternate recipe options, and more. You've seen the trailers. You've read the reviews. Now buy a ticket to a great meal. Go to HelloFresh.com slash CrimeAfterCrime14 and use code CrimeAfterCrime14 for up to 14 free meals, including free shipping. Believe the critics. They're the Newsweek's most trusted meal kit company in 2021. And mine as well. Go to HelloFresh.com slash CrimeAfterCrime14 and use code CrimeAfterCrime14 for up to 14 free meals, including free shipping. Try America's number one meal kit right now. Rated GF for great food. Welcome back, everybody. I'm super interested to hear John's story because I loved the kind of, I loved the current take of mine. I had no clue any of that was happening in the background. When I was seeing the dates of it, I was like, you got you got to be joking right now. How have I yeah. never heard of this? Yeah. But I'm someone who loves a good blast from the past. Yeah. It's interesting because yours is still kind of like, you know, yeah, there's charges. They know what the charges mm-hmm. are, but you've still got to go through the court process. Yep. And sometimes other details come out in that. It, it's going to be interesting to see what other details come out in that story. Oh, I can only imagine it's going to be insane. And I guarantee you someone's going to write a screenplay about it. It's going to be a movie at some point. Oh, it's already in the works. Actually, I think there's a book that's supposed to be coming out. They were speaking about a movie. Yeah. How yeah. Hollywood. <laughs> Very Hollywood. Uh, my story also being considered for a movie at one point, but had a very important stipulation from a victim that kind of Ooh. put it put it off. But despite that, someone has currently run with it, and now there's a podcast with a crime expert. We're going to get to all that, (laughs) but we're going to have to go to the past a little bit. We're talking about old blue eyes himself, Frank Sinatra and his son, but we'll get to that. Frank Sinatra sold 150 million records and he won 11 Grammy awards, which for you young people out there in today's terms means that he's about Ed Sheeran famous. (laughs) Um, And that's not bad for someone that couldn't even read sheet music, but he was also a television and film star appearing in over 
50 movies. Stuff you may have heard of, like the film adaptation of Guys and Dolls, From Here to Eternity, which won him a Golden Globe and an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor, Around the World in 80 Days, and the original versions of Ocean's Eleven and The Manchurian Candidate. He was friends with Hollywood elite and even chummy with President John F. Kennedy. With an amazing and long-lasting career, Old Blue Eyes really racked in the cash. When he passed away in 1998, he even took some of that cash with him. He was buried with 10 dimes in his pocket, but obviously not for their monetary value, for a reason that would touch the heart of any caring parent. Frank was married several times, but he had three children with his first wife, Nancy. Their daughter, also named Nancy, was born in 1940. Then came Frank Jr. in 1944, and finally Tina was born in 1948. Now, Frank Jr. didn't see a lot of his father, who was regularly performing residency shows in Las Vegas, going on tour, and apparently filming a movie every few months. But Frank Jr. still wanted to follow in his father's footsteps and work in music. He aspired to be a pianist and songwriter. 1963. That was the year that Russia put the first woman into space. The U.S. introduced our zip code system. Alcatraz Penitentiary closed. And, of course, friend of Frank Sinatra, President John F. Kennedy, was assassinated. As if that wasn't enough to deal with, only a few weeks later, Frank would have another event that would shake him to his core. Frank Jr. was then 19 years old, becoming a successful artist in his own right as the vocalist for Sam Donahue's band and booking numerous gigs. In early December, he was at Harris Club Lodge in Lake Tahoe, scheduled to perform a show before going off to Europe. He was in his hotel room, number 417, eating chicken with his trumpet player, a man by the name of John Foss, and there was a knock at the door. Two men claimed to have a delivery for Frank Jr. They open the door, the men storm in, they pull out a gun. Don't make any noise and nobody will get hurt, said one of the men. This is a robbery. Where's your money? Now, Foss didn't have any. Frank Jr. handed over the only cash he had, which was only 20 bucks. But this wasn't just a simple holdup. They tied up John Foss using medical adhesive tape and then kidnapped Frank Sinatra Jr. Now, John was able to free himself relatively quickly. It's yeah, kinda, well. <laughs> yeah, medical adhesive tape, which tears fairly easy if you get a good angle on it. Um, so John frees himself, uh, calls the police, but it's too late. The men had blindfolded Frank Jr., took him out a side door to their car, and they were gone. Now, by 940 that evening, the Reno office of the FBI, they're already on the case. They're meeting with Frank Sr. He wasn't really called Frank Sr., but they're meeting with Frank Sinatra in Reno. They contacted the mother, Nancy, at her, her home in Bel Air to let her know what happened. They assumed right from the start this was likely based on money, and they expected a ransom demand to be coming soon. Their plan was to have Frank Sinatra pay the ransom using money that they had photographed and cataloged so that they could then trace the money and use surveillance methods to capture the kidnappers. As newspaper headlines around the world told of the abduction, Frank's connections started offering their help. We're talking people like Attorney General Robert Kennedy, who offered oh support of the government, and even mob boss Sam Giancana, who offered to step in and use some of his tactics to bring Frank Jr. home. Oh, boy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Reportedly, Frank Sinatra said, thanks, no thanks. <laughs> thanks, but yeah, I'm going to have to pass on that. <laughs> We're going to have to pass on that. They didn't have to wait long for the ransom call. The following evening, a man called and said that they would only be communicating via pay phones to avoid FBI phone tracing. Frank Sinatra would need to next answer a pay phone at a Chevron station in Carson City, Nevada. And what did pay phones use back then, Danielle? I'm assuming dimes. Dimes. <laughs> You're right. I didn't personally use one back then, but that's my assumption. <laughs> But this part of the story is where we start to notice that maybe this team of kidnappers aren't the sharpest. Carson City is about 30 miles away from where Frank was in Reno. But the kidnappers call the Chevron station only 15 minutes later. A man working there answers the phone and is asked, is Frank Sinatra there? 
And the guy at Chevron answers, no. And he hangs up. <laughs> no, stop call- calling me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, come on. It so- sounds like a crank call, right? <laughs> Phone rings again. Is Frank Sinatra there? The Chevron guy replies, listen, buddy, I'm working on a car. I don't have time to play around. Don't call again. What happens? The phone rings again. Is Frank Sinatra there? Listen, pal, Mr. Sinatra is not in the habit of taking his calls at this Chevron station. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) So he hangs up again. Apparently, at this point, seconds later, a black car comes screeching to a halt at the station. The passenger door flies open. A man jumps out, runs up, grabs the Chevron attendant by the front of his shirt. The Chevron attendant realizes Are he's just saying? been, yeah, he's just been grabbed by Frank Sinatra. Have <laughs> I had any calls? Thankfully, the phone rings again and Frank grabs it. What do you want? Money? The guy on the other side says, of course. How much? I'll give you a million dollars if you let my son go, Frank says. Well, we don't need a million dollars. I'll let you know how much we need later. We actually, more specifically, only need like 5,400. <laughs> well, you're not far off. You're not far- really? Isn't that weird? Yes. They're going to ask for lower, Danielle. I'm going <laughs> to I'm gonna tip it off at this point in the story. They're going to ask for less. Oh, man. This Could is you a imagine? disaster. Yeah. Frank offered him a million for his and They're like, eh, I'll have to pass. <laughs> no, no. Oh, goodness. Um, Frank was then able to speak to his son briefly on the phone, and it's reported that either during that call or one of the others, it gets kind of muddy on this. Payphone operator came on asking for more money. Frank did not have any more dimes to feed the phone. The call was disconnected. But the kidnappers did reestablish contact. The disconnected call horrified Frank, who thought that his son might not be coming home from this ordeal. Mm -hmm. So from that point forward, he always carried spare dimes in his pocket. Oh, that makes me want to cry. Yeah. The kidnappers l- called later and they told Frank. Oh, no. <laughs> they wanted $240,000, <laughs> which still, Danielle, that's over $3 million in today's money. But yeah, you know, yeah they could have had a lot more. They could have had about $12 million, I guess. Uh, they set up a trail of pay phones that a courier would have to get to. So they were going to call this one pay phone. And from there, they'd give him the next location. They're basically just trying to make sure that the FBI isn't all over them. And eventually, that would lead to the drop point. Uh, Ultimately, the money was to be left between two school buses that were parked at a Texaco gas station on Sepulveda Boulevard in California. And on December 11th, the money was left at the drop location. Soon, like almost too soon, a little bit of a strange twist happens here. Um, Frank Jr. is found walking around in Bel Air. He had been freed on a nearby freeway at around 2.30 in the morning. He walked a few miles until he found a security guard. The guard took him to his mother's home nearby. She lived in Bel Air. And in total, the kidnapping ordeal lasted 54 hours. Um, There's also reports that uh, Frank didn't want to be seen or something as he was being moved around and that that security guard might have actually put him in the trunk while they transported him back to his mother's house. Uh, But Frank Jr. would make a press appearance in front of his mother's home the following day. With her standing at his side, he told everyone, I feel fine. I seem to be in fairly good health. I wasn't harmed at all. Last night when I walked from that freeway, I was so exhausted that I just kind of passed out. So the FBI interviews Frank Jr., but he states that he barely saw two of the kidnappers and he only heard the voice of a third. They were able to use that information to find the house that he was being held at, and that was in Canoga Park, which is about 15 miles away from from Bel Air. Um, But the house was being rented, was being rented under a false name uh, that they process it for evidence. As the new newspapers kept reporting on the FBI's progress, apparently one of the kidnappers got nervous and told his brother what he had done. Mm -hmm. The, The brother called the FBI. And soon, the two main kidnappers were in custody with nearly all of the ransom recovered. Now, there's this interesting little side note I just want to add here that I I found later. Reportedly, um, I think they recovered about 160 or 180,000 out of it. And when they were like, well, what happened 
to the rest of it. One of the kidnappers, I think, either gave the money to his wife or used it to buy new furniture for his wife. And the FBI asked Frank, they're like, oh, well, you know, apparently some of the money is now this furniture. Do you want it? And he was like, let her keep the damn furniture. <laughs> yeah, really? <laughs> So, oh my gosh. Not quite all of it, but uh, effectively that day they get all three kidnappers um, because there's the two guys that actually do the kidnapping. Mm -hmm. There's another guy that's involved in terms of the phone stuff. Uh, the Washington Post stated in an article they wrote about this case years later, though it was a heinous offense, the kidnapping was far from a criminal masterwork. Yeah. In fact, it was an absurd event riddled with profound incompetence and confusion perpetuated by amateurs whose previous criminal experience had been along the lines of lighting palm trees on fire for laughs. <laughs> oh, good grief. I wonder so, if their children went on to steal cookies. It, well, uh, <laughs> interestingly, one of these guys actually turns into a bit of a success himself. Oh, but, interesting. Uh, yeah, like a real estate tycoon type guy, but still is hung up on telling this story. And we'll, we'll touch on that a little at the end. But who were these criminal masterminds, Danielle? Barry Keenan says in 1963, he was addicted to alcohol and drugs after a car accident and he was nearly broke. Several years prior, he had attended the same high school as another Sinatra child, Frank's oldest daughter, Nancy. At West LA's University High, several of his classmates were from rich and famous families, a far cry from his family with a father who would go broke on the stock market, basically, and a mother that would even try to end her own life. He considered other classmates, according to an article at the Washington Post, quote, I originally thought of Tony Hope, adopted son of Bob Hope, but Bob Hope had been very active with entertaining the troops and seemed like an all-around good guy. Kidnapping Tony didn't seem like a very American thing to do. I decided upon Junior because Frank Sr. was tough, and I had friends whose parents were in show business, and I knew Frank always got his way. It wouldn't be morally wrong to put him through a few hours of grief worrying about his son. Oh. Huh. It's interesting how he kind of got himself to that conclusion. Isn't it? Now, he, he's the guy, you know, he's he's done pretty well in his his life since. Yeah. But let me just ask, just just based on kind of his view of the world with with these statements here. Would you do a podcast with him where he's no. kind of the primary focus in terms of telling this story? No. Mm -mm. Yeah. 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 Well, I had the same feeling. As a matter of fact, I, l I literally tried to work in as little of his content as possible into this version of it because <clears throat> he's a storyteller too. And some of the stuff I'm reading, I'm like, that is that real? Okay. Like that can't be real. But so uh, Keenan reached out to his high school friend, Joe Amsler, and offered him $100 a week to help with this crazy scheme that he was building up for the kidnapping. Uh, Keenan also enlisted his mother's boyfriend, John Irwin, who was almost 20 years older than the other two. These guys were about 23 when they pulled this off. Mm -hmm. John Irwin in his 40s. Uh, he was also a veteran of World War II. They figured that they needed someone tough enough to handle Frank Sinatra on the phone. Because Frank was <laughs> Frank was known to, like, you know, if he was mad with the media, you might get smacked or you might get hit. Like, he's, he's a little rough. I think he, that's he, hilarious. They're like, hmm, who's going to talk to Frank on the phone? We yeah. need someone who's, who's who's been to war. <laughs> I'm not going to do it, <laughs> Mr. Sinatra. Uh, yeah, you don't want to have a ransom conversation with Frank Sinatra and not be able to talk tough. Yeah. Literally. literally I mean, quote. I get it. <laughs> yeah. So remember how the kidnappers asked for money as soon as they got in the room? Mm-hmm. That's because Keenan didn't have enough gas money to get back to L.A. He also couldn't pay the bill for the hotel room that he was staying at in Harris. Basically, they had to pull off. They, they tried to plan this at a couple different points, uh, and they kept kind of pushing it back. This was like their last chance because Frank yeah, Jr. We don't do it. It's over. Yeah. Yeah. And they're like, oh, we're going to get stuck for this bill at this place. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, he also recounts convincing Frank Jr. to play to play along that they're friends to get through a roadblock. He basically tells Frank Jr., who's only 19, keep in mind, mm -hmm. um, you know, if we get stopped by police, there's going to be this big, crazy shootout unless you uh, act like you're our friend and, you know, you don't know nothing about what they're looking for. And, 
you know, Frank Jr. complies with that. Oh so, my gosh. It's yeah, like they, they thought of all these very bizarre details and like, yes. you know, they really thought some, it almost seems like they sat down and watched a good movie. He and did like research. Took all the key points out of it, but then like left yeah. the rest of it. And then when yep. they got to it, they're like, wait. <laughs> Yeah, no, he did. He, this was literally a business plan, at least according from to his version of the story. Um, there's a, a bit of a famous uh, band from back then. Uh, I think it's called Jan and Dean, if I remember correctly. But Dean was someone else that uh, Keenan knew. Mm -hmm. And he literally wrote up a business plan about this kidnapping and went to Dean and was like, hey, I need a little money to fund this operation, like showed him this big old plan. And I think he was asking for like $5,000. And uh, Dean was like, what What are you doing? It sounds like you're in a bad place. You need a little money here. I'll give you 500 bucks. But <laughs> apparently he wasn't, he thought that this was just a crazy way yeah. to ask for money. He didn't yeah. think that the guy was literally going to go kidnap Frank Sinatra Jr. But oh, well, man, he sure did trust the wrong people too. Yeah, yeah. I just yeah. very weird the like the level of thought that kind of went into it. Yeah. Things don't match up at certain points. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and I'm telling you, that's why I, I saw so much information from this guy, and I'm just like, either his brain just doesn't work like the rest of us, or yeah. I'm not following why some of these choices made. But there was also some things where it's like, you're telling me a fact that I know you can't know. Like he's talking about the perspective of other people and what's going mm -hmm. on. Like, I'm just like, there's no way that you knew that. Yeah. It, it's clear to me this guy is a storyteller mm -hmm. and, and, a, and an entertaining storyteller. Like I just get why. something fun. Yes. But by hooking himself into this celebrity family and this story of a kidnapping based on, I mean, it's, you know, still questionable kind of in, in my opinion my mind but uh after a four-week trial the three kidnappers were found guilty and they were sentenced to 75 years plus life however mm -hmm. that sentence qualified them for a psychiatric evaluation and it was found that keenan had no criminal malice didn't fit the profile of a normal criminal and he was declared legally and mentally insane at the time of the kidnapping His i kind of figured was, something like that would happen yeah yeah uh and Honestly, just with the information I reviewed, I'm kind of like, I'm wondering that myself. Like, mm -hmm. maybe yeah. it wasn't just at the time of the kidnapping. Yeah. Uh, his sentence was reduced, and with further appeals, he was out after serving about only uh, four and a half years. Uh, Amsler and Irwin would be released after serving three and a half years. Now, just to touch on this, a lot of people thought that Frank Jr. was actually in on the abduction plans. As a matter of fact, the legal defense team for the kidnappers even kind of brought it up at trial. Really Cla interesting. Yeah, claiming that Frank Jr. had done it all as a publicity stunt. Frank Jr. said that these rumors followed him for most of his life, and actually he rarely, if ever, would even publicly discuss the kidnapping. Outside of those quotes from where he's talking on his mother's, at the front of his mother's mansion, I, I didn't find anything in terms of him talking about this. But That's really sad. Well, yeah. I mean, especially it's sad if it's not true because you've got these claims that are like, oh, you, you're trying to like mooch yeah. off of your dad's fame or, you know, you were trying like as a publicity stunt or was it for the money? Like there's mm -hmm. there's none of that feels right or good. But uh, I originally stumbled into this story with an article at the FBI. Literally, okay. the FBI posted their own thing on this. They confirm on their page that he was not involved, stating, quote, they have strong evidence to the contrary. And also, Keenan would later confirm that that whole story was made up for the legal defense, and it wasn't true. So, Frank Jr., at least according to the FBI and the guy that actually kidnapped him, didn't know about this. Now, it's interesting... Because Keenan's information kind of blurs the lines a little bit with yeah. um, like Frank Jr. Frank Jr. for being kidnapped might have not necessarily realized what that this was a, a dangerous situation. Um, Keenan even said some stuff and I, I even I don't even know if I want to say it here. But in terms of like substances that they could have given Frank Jr. to kind of, you know, get through their checkpoints and, and nonsense, oh, nonsense yeah. like that. Um, so, but I, I just keep rolling back to this guy is 19 years old, exactly living in a life of coming up as Frank Sinatra's son, probably 
somewhat sheltered environment, you know, exactly. like how would he handle the situation where someone is coming after him and, and holding him for ransom? Like, I, I think that's just, there's so many different parallels there. Um, it's hard to understand, but uh, Sinatra Jr. would never quite receive the level of success or fame that his father did. He told the Washington Post in 2006, quote, I was never a success, never had a hit movie or hit TV show or hit record. I just had visions of doing the best quality of music. The only satisfaction is that I do what I do well. That's the only lawful satisfaction. <clears throat> Now, as Frank Sinatra started outliving his collaborators, Frank Jr. would even eventually work with his father in his later years. Uh, I believe he was uh, serving as his band leader uh, for a time, basically because Frank was at a point yeah. where he's like, I need someone close to me that I can trust to to kind mm -hmm. of deal with this. And Frank Jr., you know, had a bunch of great experience from his touring and stuff like that. And it's honestly a little sad to me to hear him talk about never being a success like that. Yeah. Like. He did a bunch of television appearances and even some stuff. It's weird because I think maybe older people would look at it and feel like it's a little bit goofy. But for some people, it would be huge. Like he was a reoccurring thing that would pop up on the family guy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's like yeah. that for, for certain people, yeah. that's a big deal. That's a yeah. Huge deal. Um, so I don't know. It's 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 kind of heartbreaking. But uh, it's reported that Frank Sinatra kept those dimes in his pocket for several decades Aww. after the scare that he experienced during his son's abduction. The FBI still calls this one of the most infamous kidnappings in American history. The story was optioned by Columbia Pictures for a film, which reportedly Frank Jr. sued to stop the deal, arguing that perpetrators should not profit from their crimes. Well, yeah, especially, you know, also when they're going to court and they're like, oh, he was actually in on it. And, you know, yeah, I mean, damn, you've already hurt this guy enough. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you don't need to keep pushing the boundaries over and over and over and over and over again. He's yeah. Now we're going to go sell this story yeah. idea and make a movie out of it. Um, and from what I understand, they actually won that. And the the film did get stopped. Uh, the, Thank but goodness. The, well, but. Oh, no. You know, Frank Jr. isn't around anymore. The story recently has become a wandery podcast series called The Grand Scheme, Snatching Sinatra, hosted by true crime expert John Stamos. You guys probably thought I was going to say John Lorden, didn't you? No. <laughs> if you did, I would cry. I would cry immediately. I would cry too, because from what I understand, it largely features the story from Keenan's point of view. They've got oh, all kinds man. of, uh, I saw Stamos talking about it a little bit. Sounds like, I don't know if he got the screenplay or just a bunch of notes from Keenan about this story, but he was kind of sitting on that stuff trying to figure out. And from what I'm seeing, Stamos wants to push this and, and try to make another project out of it, like a film or, or something like that. I don't know, but way to respect the wishes of victimized people, Uncle Jesse. I know exactly, you know, and it, man, this whole thing just like makes my stomach turn because he spent so much of his life, not, you know, not that people want to be a victim, but like he had something awful happen to him that was way out of what he was used to. Yeah. And then to feel like he couldn't even openly speak about it to anyone because he felt so strongly they thought he was involved and like lies are spread. He was just repeatedly made a victim. Yeah. And like how, what a horrible way to just crap on someone further that after death, you're still going to, you know, lean towards the side of these criminals and these people that caused this harm to him that he and, sat with his whole life. You know, I know the guy served his time and he, he became a contributing member of society, had a big success, made mm -hmm. a bunch of money. Do you need this? Like, do you need this story? It just like reeks of him being proud of what he did he uh, honestly that's why I, I wouldn't use a ton of the quotes i was seeing there is just this joy in everything yeah. as he's talking about what he went through here and admittedly like if i was a, a movie producer somewhere i'd be like wow this guy's a fantastic storyteller i think it's all bs but i think it'd be interesting you know to see on screen mm -hmm. or something like as a fictionalized story but having this particular aspect where like you've I mean, the victim sued to stop this from happening, to stop that side of the story from being told in that way and from that person profiting from it. Mm -hmm. and, and now here we are. <laughs> here we are. 
Frank Sinatra passed away on May 14th, 1998 at the age of 82. His daughter, Tina, revealed that her father <clears throat> was buried with a bottle of Jack, a Zippo lighter, a pack of Camel mm -hmm. cigarettes, and 10 dimes in his pocket to carry him on his final journey and ease his fears of not having enough change for the payphone calls. Frank Jr. passed away in March of 2016 at the age of 72 while on tour in Daytona Beach, Florida. And I want to thank the FBI, Washington Post, Esquire Magazine, Wikipedia, ThePeopleHistory.com, and WorldOfPopCulture.com for information contributing to today's story. Oh, man. First of all, not to sound like a total dingus, but I didn't even know that Frank Sinatra's son had been abducted. Yeah. Like, yeah. I didn't even know that was a thing, which makes sense now because he wanted to make sure nobody knew about that. You know, so yeah. these f false pieces of information couldn't keep going around. But yeah. what a crappy way to take advantage of people. And then, like, also, I'm trying to sit here and, like, think about their game and the, the amount of money they asked for. Like, I don't even understand. Mm -hmm. I don't even understand what their thought process was behind it. Obviously I, not getting as much money as possible. They turned down $1 million. Yeah, well, here's here's a little more insight. To, to kind of help you understand the thought process a little bit. Uh, Keenan claimed that he had convinced himself at the time that it would be an act of goodwill. And in his eyes, there was two main benefits to the kidnapping. It would help unite and strengthen the Sinatra family. Plus, the ransom money would save his own family. Keep in mind, you know, his father's now broke from the market. Yeah, exactly. His mom almost ended her own life. Um, but yeah, he really thought that this was helpful on all fronts, and oh, he was a, he was reportedly a, a very I can't even I'm having trouble saying it. He was a strong Catholic reportedly, mm -hmm. and he believed that um, by taking this money, he was going to invest it, make a bunch of money on top of it, and then he would wind up taking the two hundred and forty thousand dollars back to Frank Sinatra, because then it would have just been a loan, and that wouldn't be a sin. Oh, good grief. <clears throat> wow. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. He even, when he was in high school with uh, Nancy, mm -hmm. sometimes rode along when Frank Sinatra would drive Nancy and her friends to different places and said, quote, he was always very nice to me. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I can see where, you know, he was put through a psych evaluation and all that was going on because there's yeah, there's some connections missing. It seems like it. It seems like it. But um, which is very scary. Criminals like that. It's very scary because they're not looking at things from the perspective that we all assume that they are, you know, yeah. so it's it's difficult. Well, even the thing about like thinking that he wasn't being malicious mm -hmm. or wasn't like the typical criminal. It's like, well, he did a bunch of research, made a business plan on this. Exactly. There was still lots of like premeditation here, lots of planning. That's, there was so that's much what going I mean. on. And couldn't the approach have been premeditated to that mm -hmm. point of like, you know, oh, and by the way, if I do get caught, then I'm going to run down this plan and they're going to effectively, you know, find me insane for that period of time. I don't know. Yep. Oh, know. wow. That was a good one. I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's why every now and then I got to pull them from the past. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. I yeah. appreciate it. Well, um, we're quickly running out of time, but I think uh, we should do an extra story or two. Danielle, what do you think? You think we still got time for that? I think yes. We got I it. I say go for it. It's this audience. <laughs> All right. Uh, starting with 1999. Police responded to a noise complaint in West Austin, Texas during the middle of the night. They were surprised to find Matthew McConaughey naked playing the bongo drums with a buddy of his who was also naked, who was dancing and clapping along. McConaughey had been celebrating a win by his alma mater's football team and hadn't slept for nearly two days. He stated, quote, while I was banging away in my bliss, two Austin policemen also thought it was time to barge into my house unannounced, wrestle me to the ground with nightsticks, handcuff me, and pin me to the floor. He was taken in on disturbing the peace, possession of marijuana, drug paraphernalia, and resisting arrest when, by his own explanation, he tried to do a backflip. He, he, I saw him explain this. He literally thought, 
that he was going to impress the cops so much that they were going to let him off. Fascinating. He, he just says, he was like, I was fuzzy. You know, obviously you might've been hitting yeah. the pipe a little bit yeah. um, up for a couple of days. He thought that he was going to run up the wall, do a backflip, <laughs> get the cuffs from behind him, like put, bring, lift his legs up so yeah. that he could swing his arms under and mm -hmm. then have the cuffs in front and that they would be so impressed they were going to let him go. But he wound up headbutting the officer when he started running up the yeah. wall. Uh, he decided he was going to stay naked all the way to jail until he met an inmate that was working there that was helping with the intake process. This guy hands him some pants and says, trust me, you do want to put these on. <laughs> <laughs> so the judge dismisses the disturbing the peace and possession misdemeanors outright. His lawyer gets the resisting arrest charge dismissed in place of a violation of a sound ordinance, which turns into a $50 citation. Must be nice to be a celebrity. Yeah, really, that got reduced dramatically. <laughs> Seriously, all of that down to a $50 citation, and it was later expunged from his record. Oh, good grief. In an interview with Playboy, he asked, what's wrong with beating on your drums in your birthday suit? All For right, some all reason, right. I was about to say, nothing about this story honestly shocks me. Like right. everything about that is right on par. It sounds McConaughey, right? Exactly. Yeah. Like I could picture him doing that in a movie, which yeah. is interesting because my extra story, mm -hmm. I feel like getting out of character or, you know, I feel like it's got to be a thing. They can't get out of character. They do these interesting things. Mm -hmm. And I had to tell this one because I didn't have any idea that this happened, just like the Frank Sinatra situation. And I feel like we all kind of know there's like this dark underbelly of Hollywood and the crimes that go on behind it at this point. But did you guys know that in 1988, Mark Wahlberg was actually charged with attempted murder? So he apparently went to a local gas station. He was still a teenager, grabbed a pack of beer and was chased out. And on his way out, he beat two men, leaving one of them blind in one eye Ooh. to escape. Oh, he ended up being caught. He did plead guilty. But get this just like Matthew McConaughey. Now he wasn't famous yet. He wasn't an actor yet. Nothing had started for a couple of years, but it was bumped down to assault and he only served 45 days in prison and then went on to essentially act the exact same way in all the movies that he was in. <laughs> I'm telling well, some you, it's of the like movies, a, well, oh, but, a lot of, them, but yeah, yeah, it's very interesting to me. It's very interesting to me how like similarly they can act in their own like real life as they do on film. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And we did look, this was, this predates the mm -hmm. funky bunch. So this was before the rap career, before the movie career. Yep. Um, I just can't imagine going through life thinking that I, I took someone's sight out of one of their eyes. Like I, even someone I hated, like it mm -hmm. just, uh, I don't know. That's, you've got to carry that with you. That's, um, that's gotta be tough. It's rough. And there, I mean, there's whole lists out there of yeah. stuff that actors and singers and all these people have done well and think about it from the, the guy's point of view like you know mm -hmm. you're walking down the street and it's like oh look there's a poster for the new transformers movie oh yeah, this, exactly yeah yeah that sucks in 2010 a man walked by a convenience store in belmore new york the store was called cool stop but the guy saw something other than cool. It was a very disturbing sight. There were people armed with guns and what looked like over 30 hostages sitting on the floor. The Good Samaritan called 911 and within moments, 20 Nassau police officers responded. As they surrounded the scene, two officers entered the convenience store. Seeing the officers enter, Fred Carpenter thought to himself, I don't remember writing this. Just then, he heard one of his actors screaming, it's a movie, it's a movie. Oh, <laughs> Fred was goodness. directing an independent film and forgot to notify law enforcement that they would be filming what looked like a real life robbery. It was very tense for a while, Fred stated. Detective Sergeant Vincent Garcia said, this is a situation that could have quickly gotten out of control. Officers showed great restraint in not shooting. Oh my gosh, John. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> oh, good grief. 
call in your permits, folks. Well, not even a permit. Just let the law enforcement know. Because he was saying, I shouldn't have needed a permit because uh, we had rented the whole place. We had the agreement of the owner yeah. of the building. Like, I, I get that. But if you got, if if you're staging a scene that looks like a crime like yeah, that. Yeah, something that is endangering other people that people, passerbys can see. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, no. it's horrifying. And think about if something like that happened nowadays. Like mm -hmm. think about fast forward to time now. And I feel like so many oh, people yes. are so paranoid and scared. And I mean, like one thing happens, it's over and you never know who can get hurt in the middle of that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if Fred would have notified them, they said that they would have likely had an officer on site mm -hmm. just to make sure yeah. that nothing bad would happen in the first place. No charges were filed. And Fred Carpenter hopes that he never gets that close to a real dangerous situation again. Quote, I like make believe a lot better than reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gonna have to agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. I'm telling you, I feel like there's so many blurred lines out there in Hollywood, so many mm -hmm. tricky situations. And it makes me even more nervous. I end up digging deeper into it. I'm like, there could be so many crazy things going on that nobody knows about, but we're not gonna get into that. Who is going to win this month? Audience, you guys get to vote. Who told the best showbiz crime story? I, I don't want to jinx myself, but I don't think that the vote is going to be as one-sided as it was for last month. No, months. not I, at all. I think. I think it's going to be a bit closer, but we'll see. It's up to you guys. <laughs> You can vote at our Twitter account at Crime After Pod for the first seven days after the episode drops, or you can also head over to www.crimeaftercrimepodcast.com and you can vote there. We do have a link in the description box below, but you can always still click the little letter I up at the corner and it'll take you there as well. At Crime After Crime Podcast, you can find all the links you'll ever need, including where to find more content by Danielle and myself, how to suggest show topics. We appreciate when you do that. Join our Patreon or shop our Teespring store. And as always, a huge, huge thank you to our patrons. You guys are amazing. Patrons get bonus Patreon special segments monthly. Lots of Q&As happening, deep conversations. I highly suggest it. You get to know us really, really well. Plus, patrons get a personal shout out in an upcoming Patreon special. Next month, we're going to be back with a new topic. We are looking into cruise ship crimes. And Danielle seems excited. This is one of my favorite. I feel like I know way too many of them off the top of my head already, so I'm interested to see how it goes. This podcast is produced and hosted by myself, Danielle Holland, and the amazing John Lorden. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate or review us on whatever platform you found us on. And the best way you can help others find us is to tell your friends, tell your family, tell everyone that you love crime after crime and they need to check it out. <laughs> we'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye-bye.